first speaker is Yin, Yin Zhe Ma. Um, who we see this big in Cambridge, and he's now uh, a senior national fellow at UBC. And uh, his research uh, interests include uh, the cosmic peculiar velocity field, uh, which we'll talk about today, as well as CMB cosmology, the SD effect, gravitational lensing, 21 centimeter measurements, general statistical methods, dark energy, and inflation times. Um, so I will uh, I take over for now. Oh, thanks very much. I mean, I, I work on a couple of things, and I really like CMB as well, but the difference is that I don't live on CMB, so I can work on something else. So, uh, <laughs> So today I want to talk about a uh, work I've been doing uh, related to the cosmic peculiar velocity field. For the details, is, uh, what I'm talking is basically a velocity and gravity comparison and also uh, the story of how to test the cosmic local ball flow. So as you know that observ observers can now observe, map a large, huge number of galaxies available to study. And this is a plane of the sky out to 600 million light years. And you can see that those galaxies are grouping together. They are not completely uniform distributed. So not only the observer can map out the position of the galaxy, but they can also, also locate their position. And this is the, uh, the, the largest uh, target feature catalog we have available at the moment, which is so-called spiral field eyeband catalog, which gives you the peculiar velocity of the galaxies over the full sky, except for the galaxy region. So you can see that the red dot is the galaxy moving away from you, and the blue dot is moving towards you. So by obtaining the map of the peculiar velocity field of the galaxies, you can ask two very basic questions. So first thing is that how to compare these velocity fields with the underlying density field. Because now you can map both the velocity and also the density. And the relation between the, these two are predicted by your structure formation theory of the lambda CDM model or other gravity models. So you can make the comparison and therefore test your theory. This is one question you can ask. And the second thing is that you can ask whether some of these streaming motion of the galaxies, which characterize the observation on a very large scale, are uh, these streaming motion is really what you expected in the local volume. And you can also test these with your underlying theory and with your underlying model of the universe. So these are the themes today, question one and question two. So uh, to answer question one, let's start it uh, from the very basic thing, uh, which is uh, the gravitational instability diagram uh, in precisely the linear perturbation theory of the London CDM model. So you know that, I mean, from this uh, theory, actually, the, from this theory, the simplest thing is that uh, the time evolution of your density contrast is, uh, is linked to your underlying peculiar velocity. And through some differential equation, I don't write it here since I don't want to mess up too many details. But the important thing here, the important conclusion we can get, is that the velocity field, the 3D velocity field, could be expressed as an integral over the density contrast over some Newtonian curve. So this is the density contrast, and this is the 3D velocity field. And this is the basic effect you want to get from the linear conveyance theory. OK, and then um, the coefficient. There is a coefficient here. Uh, the coefficient clarifies the proportionality between these two quantities. One is a reconstructed field, and the other a, a reconstructed density field, and the other is velocity field. And actually, this coefficient could be uh, could actually link to the structure, to the growth rate of the structure. So beta is equal to the epsilon divided by b, and p is a bias factor, which is actually uh, the density contrast of the galaxy divided by the density contrast of the dark matter which is really the sigma 8 galaxy over divided by sigma 8. And the so-called sigma 8 is the fluctuation of galaxy or dark matter on the scale of moving 8 megaparsec. So by rearranging this quantity, you can get the beta times sigma 8 galaxy equals to the f naught times sigma 8. So this, quantity, uh, this equation is nice because the left-hand side, beta, is observational determinant. You just compare these and compare these and you see sort of coefficient, then you know the beta. So beta is operational determined, and the sigma 8 galaxy is also operational determined. You have a galaxy uh, catalog, you can just calculate what's the RMF fluctuation of it. So the left hand side is all completely oper operational determined, and the right hand side is theoretically complicated, where F0 is the growth rate at the current time, and also sigma 8 is the RMF, RMF fluctuation of dark matter on the 8 plate project scale. So, uh, 
So, so therefore, um, you can use different observational tests to draw the uh, to to compute these numbers. That's that's the reason we want to do, um, do these tests and see whether they are expected uh, with different astronomical observations. Um, okay, so to start, we need to find these parameter value, right? So we need to find this delta G and this V of G. For delta G, which is an underlying density field, you can use, uh, here we use a point source cutoff, which is a so-called PICD cutoff, which is a full sky uh, redshift survey all to a distance for about 100 or so per one percent. And so you can see that they are basically uh, distributed over the full sky. And here we separate the two different bands to aid the realization. And this is, uh, on the left hand side, SFI plus plus, as we said, is the measure of peculiar velocity field catalogs. Okay, and we can uh, cut off those no, uh, data which is really on a very high distance, which is really noisy because the error is scaled with the redshift. So uh, these the data are very noisy, and so we can select our best data, which is in the very local region, less than 70 coordinate parsec. And uh, of course, there are, as we say, as we see from the first map, the density field is really more uh, kind of denser than your measured pure velocity. That's simply because your uh, technique of measured velocity by those artificial fundamental plane method is rather technically demanding. So at the moment, we only have 3,000 or so samples, which is much less than those underlying density fields. So what you can do is to smooth them. I mean, these are galaxies with your as your density field samples, you can smooth them to match the position of your measure loss, and then compare these two things and to see whether uh, they confirm the linear fit. And so to do this, you can just, uh, this is a 3D velocity, you can study velocity field. You can just smooth them by some exponential kernel to match the position of your measure velocity. And then the rest of thing is easy, because you know that you want to compare these this is a smooth velocity field. Right? If you project them onto a light outside directions, which is radial directions, and then you want to compare these with your measured velocity field. And the real coefficient is a bit of time, the things that you want to search. Okay. And this is a chi square study. And, um, and here is our result. So by applying these different catalog to the value field, catalog, as we mentioned, spiral field light band catalog, which is a poly feature catalog for the spiral galaxy. ENVR catalog, which is the early type of catalog uh, for the for this uh, elliptical galaxy by using bottom of fundamental plane method to determine its first distance. And also A1SN and SN are the two different supernova catalogs. So by using these different catalogs, you can just uh, apply them to the light equals and to study their uh, uh, values and here to, to probe their values. So here is a beta parameter. It is Right. I mean, these different catalogs, they, although you know their preferred distance is slightly different, but the beta parameter seems to be quite overlap on the regime of uh, 0.53 or so. And not just for these, but also you can, because the sigma galaxy can be also computed. So you modify this beta times the sigma galaxy, you obtain the theoretical quantity of f times sigma. Uh, here, what we combine, uh, time, which is the result of f, times sigma a, which is about 0.42 also, which is really well consistent with the uh, WMAP constraint. If you use WMAP uh, values of those uh, fundamental parameters, you compute what f is and you compute what sigma a is, and then you can get the pretty well constraint, which is uh, consistent with your velocity field study. So these are two different important problems. So it means that, that your uh, underlying structure formation theory is basically right. And one, the other thing I want just want to mention is that um, these can be also, uh, you see that this is Huston and Turnbull. Turnbull is Huston's graduate student, they are based on University of Waterloo. And they use these values uh, on different redshift to basically to test whether your variety theory is, uh, is right or the other things, is your GR or the other things. Here is FD, uh, FDGP and here is OPGP. Uh, I'm not sure what O means, maybe you can check this later. So uh, and this is this, this line is for the standard value. And you see that these are different um, 
here is uh, the velocity of data, and here are some other uh, WZ data. And you see that uh, the basically uh, the low redshift velocity of data can add up some extra level arm in constraining the evolution of F time simulation, which is a good way of testing the gravity theory. So now we basically have already been uh, already been searching for that bit parameter. But how well is that fit? How well is that your measure velocity compared with your reconstruct velocity? And this is what you look at. So uh, so that left hand side is a measured velocity field. And this is uh, this is a reconstructed predictive velocity field if you fit beta equals one. So the beta, so the linear fit is here. The slope is here. You can see that for the supernova tunnel, the data is pretty well aligned, uh, uh, scattered along that linear field lines. So basically it means that the, the, the most of the large scale of velocity mode is basically consistent with our linear, pred uh, linear theory prediction. Except that um, here we use some hyperparameter because uh, actually the hyperparameter indicates that maybe the error bar is slightly underestimated. If you inflate the error bar a little bit by 40%, it's better covered this, uh, this red line. And if you subtract all these two things with the red line, you see that uh, the residuals are pretty well scattered along these lines. Okay, so, um, so this is the story of my first talk, which is how to compare the velocity field with a, with a gravity field. And we have already seen that for, the, for those catalogs, which is not very deep, is uh, around 17 <coughs> of the parsec, these two things are pretty well consistent with each other for those large scale uh, linear modes. So the next story is that workflow statistics, I mean, if some of these guys are moving away from you or moving towards you at some particular speed, which is a streaming motion of the galaxies, if there is some bulk flow, then are these really uh, are these bulk flow really uh, excess power of perturbations on some on some particular scales? Is there real excess power flow? This is the second question we want to ask. As you guys are pre probably pretty young, uh, that this field has been uh, th th this has been a pretty heated debate over the past two decades, actually, and because of this field actually evolving pretty slow because of the demanding technique of improving observations that these things uh, uh, still haven't been solved over like 22,000 or so. And only because this uh, spiral field eyeband catalog, which is the largest peculiar velocity field catalog, become available, this question just brought up uh, onto the horizon by these group of people. So it's important now to solve this problem with, uh, uh, you know, with the new data set that we can obtain now. OK, so let's. Uh, Ah, so can you speed up? It, it was the 70s when the first was the first uh, four decades. Sorry, I changed my language. Four decades. Okay, so uh, let's have a basic idea of what does this mean. If you have a set of galaxies on the sky, and these are galaxies that may have some velocities, and you can probably decompose velocity onto some modes of cohumic motion. Here, we write it as bulk motion. Means that these guys may have some co-moving velocities, streaming velocities around this particular direction. And, and after that, uh, there should be some other residual velocity modes. Right? Those guys may have um, residual velocity modes, either like these, like these, like these. So you can see that the bulk motion really carries uh, the, the information on very large scales. Because it looks like that here I have some very big massive, you know, like a uh, great attractor or something else to, uh, to pulling those guys towards this particular direction. Right, so bulk flow really tells you the information on a very large scale. On the other hand, the velocity dispersion is tells you the local potential, basically, around those galaxies. So one information is the perturbation on a very large scale, and the other is information on pretty small scales. So these are the things that we want to, why we want to decompose velocity. And we are interested in not just, and uh, not actually, not quite interested in the local potential, even though uh, they may be interested on it or the right. But we are more interested on off motion and to see whether, what cosmology information it can carry to us. And that's the question we want to ask. And from the pretty, uh, 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 sorry, from the previous equations of the linear perturbation, actually, actually uh, the velocity 
power spectrum could be also expressed as the uh, link to the matter power spectrum. I mean, these equations, you can derive them from the previous integral. It looks like there, is, there are no, uh, no uh, relationship there, but actually just some simple mathematics, you can use these, these equations pretty easily. So the velocity power spectrum is linked to the matter power spectrum. But you know that, you notice that it's a carry another one power of one over k squared. So this means that comparing the matter power spectrum, the velocity power spectrum carries more power on larger scales because of this one over k squared factor. So, and also, because your matter power spectrum is linked to those parameters, I mean, this is one of the simple fit uh, of the, uh, what I call the fitting formula for the matter power spectrum. You see that the velocity power spectrum finally is linked to the parameters of your um, matters and uh, barons and also expanded history. So from this, you know that once you have the velocity field kind of, you can definitely do cosmology because these things are cosmological parameter related quantities. You can definitely do it. And this is actually what people have been doing, uh, have done actually, uh, one of the things that well at 2009, they use the velocity field uh, power spectrum, uh, of velocity field data to fit their longer CDM model. And, but surprisingly, they find a pretty large value of the RMS fluctuations, which is sigma eight, right? Which is the uh, RMS fluctuations on a common partial. So Dr. Matt tell you this value, point eight also, but they find a value which is pretty big, as, well, as big as two. This is, you see that, this is black man lower limit, which is still excluded, which is still outside this region. So this is really big. So why is that? I mean, this has been a puzzle. I and mean, uh, from two, before, even before 2009, there were some puzzles. And in 2009, they reposted it, and it's become a serious puzzle. And uh, actually, uh, people have been debating it in different conferences. But I think I have uh, one of the solutions for this by doing more careful analysis. So I think there are several caveats which may lead to the astronomical results. So first thing is that uh, the way that people are doing it, because they, uh, at the beginning of this field, there are very few pretty precise measures of the particular velocity field catalogs. So what people are, are like to do is to mix different cutoff together. For instance, these are uh, SC, SMART, EPA, and WIMIC are the two, another two different cutoffs, uh, which based on fundamental plane measure. However, they are pretty far away. They are uh, as far as 90 per uh, uh, parsec, and those WIMIC is even more far away. And also, these cutoffs are pretty uh, localized on some particular region. They are not as uh, full scale distributed as a spiral field event cutoff. So they are very distant and they're very sparse. And also, uh, in their anal uh, analysis, the small scale velocity dispersion, uh, which is, as we said, is the characterized local potential, is assumed to be 100 or so megaparsec. But it should be around 400 or so. I mean, this could arise some uh, quantitative difference. Because uh, for the small scale velocity dispersion, it should contain the component of the small scale random motion Plus, uh, plus the uh, thermal noise and also nonlinear velocities. Uh, after all, you combine the different components, and some people have estimated each of the terms. You, it should be an order of 400 kilometers per second. So this may cause some quantitative uh, results, quantitative difference. And also, they're not uh, using very accurate power spectrum pro 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 uh, approximation. Actually, you, at the moment, you should use the most uh, precise, like those softwares, but rather than doing the what I call the, uh, the uh, uh, fitting formula, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This may cause some quantitative difference. And here is quantitative difference, uh, different from your uh, kind of calculations at different scales. Uh, and also, there is important thing that there is no Marcus by corrections. So uh, I probably don't have enough time to talk about what is Marcus by. So basically, the thing is that if you, if you, because your distance measure have errors. Right? And you have your underlying inhomogeneous distributions. So when, when you measure a galaxy at some particular distance, the its true distance could come from the either from the distance which is less than your measured distance, or its true distance could be greater than your measured distance. But if you have an inhomogeneous distribution, then it's probable that it's, uh, it's possible that it actually comes from the region which is the distance greater than your measured distance. Um, or, or the other way along. So this is a common, uh, kind of multi-spike directions when you, when you measure the distance, galaxy distance. 
and we can correct for that by doing by using annual intensity. And also, the, there is no selection of the data. They use full catalogs. But the problem is that the, for the very distant, uh, very distant object, they are very sparse. And the, the correlation, uh, and also the distance, uh, sorry what I thought, the systematic is sometimes underestimated. And because your error is actually scaled with the redshift. So you can restrict your data to be at 80 or so many parsecs. So by doing this treatment, careful treatment, you can already reach a pretty uh, sensible value for the low flow value. And here is the kind of you use. And you can see that for if you if you choose a preferable scale like 50 meg per second, you reach I mean uh, you reach uh, a value of B for the RMS for the lambda CDM model, which is about 300 or so. And this is really pretty well overlap with what we find by applying these catalogs to uh, you know to the likelihood model. And so the, the, this is the uh, phi over theta, which is phi is a directly likelihood, uh, a longitude, and cosine theta is theta is uh, uh, basically the other angle of the directly likelihood. And you can see that the direction is pretty well uh, consistent with the other, these are other findings, and these contours of the direction we find pretty well consistent. And uh, so therefore, I um, mean, by applying these individual catalogs, you see this is the probability of the sigma a uh, pretty well, pretty well consistent with your know, lambda CPM uh, double band seven fifty value, which is the wrong view. So for each individual catalog, we find they're pretty well consistent, not just uh, not, not like what they claim. That's a serious problem. But I think the most important thing is the way that people combine catalogs. And the reason I'm saying this is because when you have different catalogs. For instance, like this, you have a catalog here, you have a data set here, a data set right here. And these two data sets are actually not very well consistent because they give you different intersection and also different scope. So if you fit them by using a, a, a simple chi-square for each of the data sets, you reach the um, vesting value uh, for the for this data set, you reach vesting value here, for this data set, you get vesting value here. But if you combine these two catalogs together, you may reach a joint contour somewhere in the middle. Right? And here you interpret that this data set is preferable by is a, is a preferable data set by these two data set, uh, preferable uh, solution for these two data sets. But actually this data set is excluded by this data set, for instance, at two sigma. Also excluded by this data set at two sigma. So, so, so it sometimes gives you a misleading result if you combine these two data sets directly together. And that's the point. So here we use a so-called hyperparameter method where you can weight your data set. Because each of the data sets may have different systematics and therefore they should carry different weights. So here I, uh, we, we modify this parameter onto it and use uh, marginalize, automatically marginalize that parameter. Actually it could be done analytically by these papers. And here, if, if the two data set doesn't have, is not consistent, then you will obtain a contour like this. It tells you that it has two weights, basically, um, uh, you know, two, two things, three center and different values. And this is a more careful study when you combine with your data set, which is extremely sensible for those peculiar velocity field studies. So by doing this, you can see that uh, we can, we can uh, apply this method for our you know, different peculiar velocity samples. And actually, the, the orange line is what we get. You see that it peaks at uh, point uh, eight also pretty, pretty well. It's really consistent. I mean, the, the, the amplitude of fluctuation is really consistent with what you get from W. And also, uh, I mean, these are contours. Just from <coughs> one single shell, uh, one single distance, you see that, uh, I mean, although the contour is not close, because it's just about uh, one velocity uh, data, but it's pretty well, I mean, the dumping that value is pretty on the center. So they are, I mean, the, the, the theory is, is uh, uh, very consistent with uh, the, your data. So by comparison, this is what they do, and this is what we do. Dumping uh, match five years, we do dumping seven years, parameters, similar values are different, PLK coverage are slightly different, decent indicator, uh, multiplied, uncorrected, recorrected, catalogs, catalogs, we use higher precision catalogs, data selection, we trim the data set, we 
you know, to be a strong uh, breakthrough the data set to be actually like processing also. Um, and the important thing is that combination method they just directly combine, but we use hyperparameters. So therefore the result here it should double tap at 99%. On the other hand, if you do careful analysis, you should reach you should reach these. I mean these are for individual kind of and this is for hyperparameters. So if I um, uh, ask a little bit more about um, the hyperparameter which is you know, it looks like a good method, but it's also a gradient system that's penalizing what uh, is outlier and that would be correct. So uh, you presumably can draw information on which data set is going to be like, or is it just doing a linear combination? So what it's doing as far as it's essentially changing the calibration. Is that it's essentially changing the calibration of each uh, experiment. And so um, uh, you know they they must have their comments on what their true calibration uncertainty is. And uh, and you are challenging it by using the type of parameter. Um, so um, if you go down the list, you get a presumably get a you know, a mean hyperparameter for each one of these experiments. So which one is it most dislike? For those one is it most like? Oh, well, the, the, the uh, supernova catalog is uh, most like. But the others, like uh, what I call illegal galaxy catalog is less like. Yeah. Which is this like? An illegal galaxy catalog. Illegal galaxy catalog. Is less like we will discuss further because I have only three minutes. Let me finish. Uh, so and also you can calculate, uh, you can do the uh, because I what we said is that we figure out the ball flow on particular distance and we just use that three numbers to figure out cosmology, which is, the information is definitely not uh, the maximum information. So the maximum information you can get is to basically figuring out the flow on different distances. And then you, and of course those flow numbers are correlated, and you calculate their coin matrix of those different shells. And what we call it is multi shell method. And after we do these, here is some mathematics. If you build them in the likelihood, and then you can find that, I mean, you can find your own UM, your sigma A values, which is, you see, pretty well uh, uh, covered with your, uh, the other CMD constraint. And the, uh, this is a 2D two dimensional contour. So for conclusion, the peculiarity field data mostly come from the region less than 70 megaparsec, and large distance samples are noisy and sparse. From density field, you can reconstruct your 3D velocity field and smooth and project it to the left side directions, and then compare it with the measured velocity, and the method is applicable to the other uh, data set. So when you combine your catalog, it's possible to induce systematic errors if the different catalogs have different calibrations. Hyperparameter uh, is one way, one way to avoid this. Uh, given all of the careful bias corrections combining technique, we find that the peculiar velocity field data provides consistent results with lambda CDM density field. And the flow provide, doesn't provide strong evidence against the lambda CDM models. And in the future, I, I mean, this is just a very, run through very quickly. We have the CCF uh, view, uh, CCF uh, density distance and ratio surface. And there's a rumor that uh, uh, CCF may provide um, Indicate some flow which is really bigger than what you uh, indicated uh, indicated by the by your adopted CDM model, and this is just a rumor because after after if you're averaging more and more bulk flow data on large scales, you should get a decline of your RMS flow. But CCM seems to be slightly bigger, than that. but this is rumor. We haven't got the data yet. I, I took slide from some other people. The other thing we can do is for the condenser SE effect, because as uh, people mentioned in their CMB talks, here uh, if, uh, the CMB backlight is scattered by your moving cluster. So by observing the distortion of your uh, of your spectrum, you can measure actually the whole mo moving motion of those gas clusters. And this is another way to constrain the local box. So uh, the thing so these topics that we are discussing today seem to be interesting, and I think they are going to uh, confront uh, People confront as farmers with some challenges in the coming decade. Thanks very much. Any questions? Okay. So, um, on your hyperparameter, you can go back to uh, the results. Yeah, here. Here? No, of the table.
of the tree. Okay. Okay, great. So uh, the sigma a from s of i and what is that mean here? They are large, right? They are larger than one. But then your hyperparameter sigma a is very low. Because, because some of your catalogs are giving you a sigma a of yeah, I think so. Uh, I think some of these catalogs are pretty low, at least. At least these catalogs are pretty low. Uh, yeah, at these catalogs are pretty low. Yeah, so it's better. Yeah. So isn't that an indication that the sigma 8 galaxy is not well determined? Because I mean, sigma 8 should be like consistent across the sample. So, I mean, what does this tell you about the sigma galaxies as far as this scatter? Uh, this is not. I mean, this is taking for the theoretical model. Yes. This is sigma eight in the dark matter sigma. Yes, I know. But these don't agree. Like, you have sigma eight dark matter of like point five. Well, and then well, but but you see, it's pretty broad. <laughs> yeah, that's the You can't draw a strong conclusion of it. I mean, the distribution seems to be pretty broad, which is true the other side. And our next speaker is uh, Joachim Ar Arnaud. Um, he did his PhD here, actually, at the University of Toronto and CETA uh, with Wei Li. Uh, he's now a CETA National Fellow at UBC, although he's uh, working from McGill University. Um, currently, and today he will talk about uh, quantifying uh, robustly quantifying cosmological errors. So just wait uh, a moment for that. Okay. All right. So um, as most of us are aware now, um, in the standard model of cosmology, about the seventy percent of the energy density is in the form of dark energy. And uh, it is thought to drive the accelerated expansion of the universe. Uh, but we know very little about dark energy. It seems to be consistent with the cosmological constant, but uh, many theoretical models fit otherwise. So if you want to uh, distinguish between these models, then uh, we need to measure dark energy at the first level of precision. Um, so out of different avenues to measure dark energy, this talk will focus on uh, uh, detection of variated acoustic oscillation from the two-point function of galaxy surveys. Uh, it's work which I've uh, done mainly with the Whaley bench here because my thesis is back there. So uh, currently about a dozen data analysis are uh, measuring DAOs. Uh, this is a Weagles survey. Uh, this is SDSS. This is a 600 field survey, dark energy survey, physics of the X-ray universe, PANSTAR, LSSB. So lots of effort and money goes into measuring dark energy. And um, most of the current and future analysis based are uh, uh, are based on one simplifying assumption about the statistics of the matter field they're observing. They assume that the matter field is a Gaussian random field in their analysis. Uh, and this is a good approximation when your survey is of moderate resolution. Uh, but when we analyze large structure with increasing resolution, like these future experiments, uh, then we have to be careful uh, because uh, anybody simulations which can prove these large scales, uh, these um, small scales, they carry a warning message. Uh, they say that if uh, you do a Gaussian analysis, then the, the measure DAO, the dilation scale, is a suboptimal measurement. But the error bar you get is biased. And so this talk is about um, removing this bias by including um, nonlinear effects, basically. So um, before going into the details, I'll uh, briefly explain how we go from a measurement of the, the dark matter part spectrum to a measurement of dark energy. Uh, then I'll, um, I'll elaborate a little bit on the current problems with the estimates of the error bars in the current analysis and try to, uh, <laughs> I'll try to explain how we did improve these. Um, so, uh, suppose you want to measure dark energy, how do you do? So one of the ways, here's the three minute questions, uh, you need to measure the, uh, the expansion of the universe as a function of time or redshift. So here's Friedman equation. This is uh, Friedman's parameter, uh, h. 
so um, suppose that you're able to measure H, then you have a handle on the dark energy uh, density and on its equation of state omega. So, um, but how then, how do you measure H? So if you know of an object, if you can detect an object of a known co-moving size, a standard ruler, you can measure it along the line of sight or perpendicular to the line of sight, then you can map your measurement of delta Z and delta angle to H and DA. And DA is the angular diameter distance. So, and so with these, then you can go back to this equation and uh, have information about dark energy. And the variating acoustic oscillations are perfect standard ruler uh, because um, basically uh, they are remnants from sun waves which propagated in the primordial plasma. And uh, by the time that uh, electrons recombine, um, the sun waves uh, have no pressure support. So the, the wave front froze in time. And then uh, that was at a distance of about 150 megaparsec. And now we freely expand with the universe. So this is a little sketch where you have these wave fronts frozen and they expand and stretch with the universe. So if you are able to detect these, these are good standard rulers. So the program here is um, to measure a galaxy catalog and to measure its power spectrum and to look for, for these wave fronts. Now in real space, the wave fronts look like a bump in the two-point function. In Fourier space, they look like wiggles. So this is the wiggles you survey. Here is a power spectrum to measure uh, if you divide by a smooth plane, you see the wiggles, and the red line here is the spherical model. And from the spherical model, the next step, we get the cosmological parameters. So uh, when we do something like that in the data, it is complicated by the fact that what you observe <coughs> is the power spectrum you observe is a mixture of the underlying power spectrum and the survey mass. And um, to combine these two, it's a little bit delicate. So uh, in 1994, Feldman, Kiss, and Kipa, they proposed a prescription. It's a Gaussian estimator, which, uh, which uh, basically uh, boils down to this equation here. So if the power spectrum, the underlying power spectrum is this object, what you observe is this. It's simply a convolution with the window survey mass, or it's called the window selection function. So you do a convolution, and then you have an estimator, which is uh, unbiased, if your field is Gaussian. Um, they also propose an estimator for the error bar. It's also a Gaussian estimator. So Wiggles and survey use that description. It's not the only survey that did. And this is the, the, the cross correlation matrix in the power spectrum measurement for the Wiggles and survey. It's a Gaussian estimator. So it's uh, all the orthogonal elements here are only, um, they only appear because of the convolution with the survey function. There's no uh, there's no coupling between the free modes. However, we know that the coupling between the, the free modes exists because as gravity forms nonlinear structure like halos and clusters of galaxies, free modes align together to form these. So uh, this this is, for instance, obtained from 400 simulations by Ryan and Hadel in 2005, and um, <coughs> they measure this same matrix, and they see that uh, as you go to smaller and smaller scales, the correlation just gets stronger and stronger, both get up to 90% of the thing. So uh, it means that somehow this is this is no longer Gaussian. So the question is, how much these non-Gaussian effects affect the measurement of the BAO and of the dark energy? So um, when we perform these analysis, we uh, you could do a Fisher matrix uh, from Alison or you could do a Casper analysis. So but in both cases you need to invert this correlation and count the, the numbers of degrees of freedom. So this plot here shows the cumulative number of degrees of freedom about your power spectrum amplitude as a function of the smallest scale included in your survey. So this dotted line here, that's the Gaussian description. So as you include smaller and smaller scales in the Gaussian case, you have smaller, they have more and more information, it's more and more uh, degrees of freedom, because everything is independent. But in the simulation, modes are coupled together. So you have less information, you have less degrees of freedom, fewer of them. So you see this, this plateau here, there's a saturation in the numbers of degree of freedom as you approach the nonlinear regime. So when we propagate that into the, the various acoustic oscillation measurement, here's what we have. Uh, we have. We have three different estimators at two different redshifts. So blue is version one, 
latent switch is 0 0.5, so let's focus on the black one. The first estimator, estimator for the error bar about the VAO is the Gaussian estimator, which is applied on a Gaussian field. This is what the FTP um, description gives you. And so this one has been mapped to a straight line here, just so you can understand this. Um, the second estimator is, is, is the same estimator, but you don't apply it on a Gaussian field. You apply it on a non-Gaussian field. And you have the, the red line here. So the error bar is, there's a discrepancy by about 50%, 10, 50% between these two. And the problem is that the FTP estimator gives you this one, but you should be citing the red one because what you observe is not linear. So, so this, this discrepancy here, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a bias which you should um, include in your analysis. So, um, when you propagate that into dark energy, this is at the dark energy equation of state, omega zero, omega a, omega a basically characterizes the direction of evolution. And um, all the future experiments are trying to minimize the area of this ellipse, basically. But if you have a bias on your VAO, then this ellipse just gets, gets, gets bigger. Or you think it's small, but it, it's bigger than you think. So, um, so um, you should really uh, understand what is the bias so that you know how to construct your future survey experiment in the future telescope. So uh, the black line here, the inner one, is when you have an optimal Gaussian estimator acting on the Gaussian field. So you think you have the black line, but in fact you might have the blue line. So, so, uh, so you build a new telescope, and then you're, you have an error bar which is no better than the previous one because of this bias that you don't really understand. So uh, what we want to do here is to include this bias in the, in the analysis. And our approach is to extend the FKP uh, formalism to allow for this mode doubling. So uh, this is uh, the, the FKP estimator for the power spectrum. We just do a brute force estimator of the covariance matrix. So this, this, is, this, this is the covariance. And you have the convolution here uh, applied on both fields now. So the term in the square bracket that's the, it's the covariance, it's the underlying covariance of your field without the mask. And what you observe is this convolved two packs, but in three dimensions. So it's a six dimensional convolution that you would need to solve in order to have an unbiased estimate of your error bars. So this is computationally just not possible. You need to simplify somehow. And the other challenge is that this object here, it's not isotropic. The, as, as I said, the, mode, the, the Fourier modes couple together and they couple stronger if the angle between them is smaller. So it's not as a trap. If we have to measure this covariance as a function of two scales and the angle between them, the average over there. So, and uh, there's, uh, these kinds of calculations has, have not been tested against theory and by simulations. So, so the, best, the best way is to use simulations to, uh, to, to measure this object. An attempt to do the convolution. So um, we use QP3M, that's an uh, everybody code which solves gravity on a two level mesh. Uh, the long range force of gravity is solved on a coarse mesh, and it's an MPI parallel. The short range of gravity is solved on a finer mesh, it's open MP parallel, and the two gravity are just, um, they are matched with the kernel. And we have also PP interaction at the subgrid level with, um, yeah. And then this code is highly performant. It scales up to 27,000 cores, which is 100 times larger than the helium simulation. It has a low memory footprint, lower than gadget, and it's very fast because it uses uh, FFT. It's, uh, it's um, optimized for speed as well. So uh, for instance, for this work, we use uh, 200 n-body simulations of a million particles each, and it ran in, in less than a day. So it's a very fast code. Um, if we measure here, that's the measurement of the angular dependence of the covariance matrix. So um, on this panel here, the two scales are identical, and we just show um, the, the covariance as you change the angle between the Fourier nodes, basically. And we have not shown the zero angle, because the zero angle is the Gaussian, um, it's the Gaussian case, basically. Um, in the Gaussian prediction, there is no correlation if the two modes are not aligned, but we see here that there is up to 50% correlation. And as you go to larger angles, then correlation drops down. 
So this is what we meant by isotopic covariance um, inverse. And the right panel here is when the two modes are not on the same scale. So there will be an offset between the two scales and we still vary the angles. And we still, still see a correlation, 20% correlation for small angles. So um, when we include them in the analysis, it's a little bit hard because we need to, to look at these plots for every pair of 40 modes, so that's a lot. We need to organize and simplify the results. So the first thing to do is, since these, these curves are smooth, we do a Legend multiple expansion, and we look at the, the multiples. And um, so this is, uh, so for each multiple, we have a matrix. We have C0 matrix, C2, C4, and uh, if we look at the diagonal of these matrices, and divide by the Gaussian prediction, we have deviation from Gaussian. This is L0, L equal 2, L equal 4. And by the time we reach L equal 6, it's almost equal to, to Gaussian. So uh, we don't really need higher multiples. This is for the diagonal. Here are the other diagonal elements. This is L equal 0, L equal 2, L equal 4. And again, by the time we reach L equal 6, it's almost an identity matrix, uh, which is the Gaussian prediction as well. So it seems that we only need three multiples. That saves a lot of time and space for computers. And uh, also, uh, this is very smooth. We can fit that with a parallel, these two multiples. We can look at the eigenvectors of these matrices. And so surprisingly, only a few of them are really significant. So we can fit these eigenvectors with parallels as well. And now uh, we can uh, tackle the, the, the convolution. These are the fitting, best fitting parameters. Uh, we call them uh, the non-Gaussian parameters. And um, now we can do the convolution. We can try it. Uh, so we need to find a survey mask and see what happens. So we picked the survey mask from the 2 kill galaxy Richard survey. It was the only one which was modern and uh, available at that time. And uh, so this is, this is uh, the geometry. This is a 2 time. And um, we extract the first non-Gaussian error bars on um, the power spectrum of the two digital surface, basically. So uh, this here is the cross collision matrix. And we see that by the time of of 0.2, 0.2 is still it's at the mild uh, nonlinear regime. Most are already 50% correlated when you include the convolution. And uh, when you look at the diagonal here, by the time of K of 0.2, here, the dotted line, this is your FKP uh, estimator. Uh, the dashed line here is the n-body simulation without the convolution, and the thick line is n-body plus convolution. And there's a factor of 10 difference between, that's the square, that's the variance, it's a fractional variance in the far spectrum. There's a factor of 10. So when we include the geometry in the convolution, it enhances the non-Gaussian features. That's this bump here, that's what it shows. So, the 15% bias we had on the DAO uh, is actually a lower bound because it did not include the convolution with the survey selection function. With this here, we showed that it, it could be 20%, 30%. We don't know how much. So we should do these analysis on the data to, to find out how, how biased that is. A few words of caution here. Um, the results I've just shown only apply to the geometry of the 2 degree field Richard survey and with the simulations. And um, the non-Gaussian parameters that we're using these calculations, um, we, they are valid for the cosmology in the redshift or simulation. But if we change these, then the parameters surely will change. And in the data, we don't use dark matter particles. We have galaxies which trace halos. So surely the non-Gaussian parameters will differ. So how do we deal with that? Well, uh, ideally, what one would do, would like to do, is to avoid using simulations. I use only data, so try to find a way to estimate these non-Gaussian parameters internally from the data. And a big problem is that in the data, you don't have 200 lines of sight, or 200 patches. You have only a handful, maybe three, four, five. So how, the question is, how well can we measure these non-Gaussian features if you have only, say, four uh, observation fields? So if you had 200, this is the covariance matrix. If you have only four, you have this one. And we see it's very noise, right? So noise becomes important. 
especially when you uh, cross go like large and small scale. So this is noticeably become important. But still, if we look just on the diagonal here, this is with 200 simulations, and this is with only four. That's the ratio of the covariance with the Gaussian prescription. And we see that even with only four, we see deviation from Gaussian. So there is definitely hope to measure Gaussian uh, features with only four fields. And uh, we have a few tricks in our pockets as well. The first is that uh, when we break down the covariance as a, a Gaussian and a non-Gaussian part, the Gaussian part is to try to replace it with the analytical prediction. It could remove some of this. That's the first thing to try. Uh, second thing to try also is that from the template, we know properties about the noise of the signal and uh, the noise of the template here as well. So we can devise a Wiener filter and try to remove some of this noise. And uh, the third trick we have also is that, again, from the template, uh, we know properties about noise, properties about the eigenvalues of the position. We can focus this into eigenvectors. Eigenvalues have noise. We can bootstrap them, and we can find out which eigenvectors are more important and better, uh, better measured. So we can optimize the way we do the eigenvector, or it's basically a, a principal component decomposition uh, analysis. So with these tricks, this is what we have here. So once again, this is the counting of the degrees of freedom. This was the Gaussian case here, which just goes on. And the different lines here are the different trials we just had. Um, the, um, we divide these lines with the template of 200 simulation, which has a map to the line here. And we see that the other lines are with only four fields that are picked. And we can recover the template to within like 20% or so, 20-25%. So this is to be compared with like a factor of 100 if you use Gaussian. So this is FKP, and this is what we propose here. So, um, um, yeah, so if, you're, if you look back at this, uh, um, the era of the DAOs, here are different estimators. So let me try to walk you through that. The, the, um, the dotted line here, again, was when we applied a Gaussian estimator on a Gaussian field. The red line is when we apply the same Gaussian estimator on the non-Gaussian field that we recover this 10-20% this, uh, bias. And uh, the black line here is if we use the template with 200 simulation. The magenta line here is if we use the best fitting parameters with these things. And you see that magenta traces quite well the black line. So there's almost no bias between the magenta and the black. But the question here is, okay, so what if these non-Gaussian parameters are not as well measured in the data? Well, so we did 30% expression about each of these non-Gaussian parameters, and we got the blue line. So still, now what we compare is not blue with dot, because we know it's non-Gaussian. We compare blue with black. And this is 2% difference. So we have reduced the bias to 2% with 30% accuracy of the non-Gaussian parameters, using only four fields. So I think we should try this on data. That's, that's the message I'm trying to push here. Uh, there's one step which is missing, though, before we can do that, uh, is that in the data what you measure as opposed to simulation is not in position space, it's in redshift space. So all the galaxies that you have in your catalogs, you know they're redshift. In the R, so basically they are in richest space. The distortion means that their position is a mixture of their real location plus a redshift, which is due to Doppler shift, basically. So there's a, uh, there's an ambiguity of where the object actually is. So we would need to repeat this in redshift space with the simulation and see if we can do the same kind of uh, uh, parameter, how that goes. So uh, this is future work coming, uh, coming up soon. But uh, there's no reason why that would not work. And it's definitely worth trying because millions of dollars are invested in these telescopes. So uh, here's a summary of my thought. Uh, the Gaussian error bars on the DAO dilution scales are at least 15% biased, even in the absence of uh, survey masks. Um, combining non-Gaussian error bars with the survey is challenging because, uh, because you need to measure 
the covariance as a function of two scales plus an angle, uh, you have also a six-dimensional convolution with your service function function, so you need to simplify things. Uh, the non-Gaussian features are enhanced when you do this convolution. But from only four uh, realization, we can recover the non-Gaussian features within 20% actually. Finally, a 30% precision on the non-Gaussian parameters could reduce the VAO to like person one or two percent level. <laughs> so, can you comment on what Glass and FCSS have done recently with this reconstruction method? That they use, I think, to try and suppress nonlinear uncertainties. I mean, you're quite, you mentioned a 15% bias, whereas the latest Glass measurements are at 2% determination of the you know, DB over RS. So, so can you comment on their methods and what they're doing and how that connects to this? Yes, so um, so you mentioned reconstruction. So basically what they did is to use an algorithm which uses uh, linear theory to go back in time. So basically you, you know what, what's the gravitational potential from the location of your galaxies. And then you can use linear perturbation theory to try to go back in time to see this object is in this field, so it must have been there before. It's falling in the gravitational potential. And when you go back in time, uh, you sort of undo some of the nonlinear features. Because if things are collapsing, you go back, they're less collapsed, most are less coupled. So it reduces the, uh, the amount of, um, of bias, basically. Uh, it depends which bias. Uh, so <laughs> the, in their analysis, they, they, they did not include mold coupling. So, so uh, as far as I can tell, they did not have a full covariance matrix with the mode coupling and convert that. Mm. Okay, well, I'll have to read it. Look at that and you have to claim this that even though the, um, the claim L bar gets smaller, the bias of the plot gets smaller. So you, so you, yes, you can get a better detection, but it's still biased. It's not with the wing. You did yeah. exactly what they did and you concluded that it doesn't help. I mean, it helps, yeah. but it's, it's, you stay biased. Okay. Any, speaker, yeah. or any, any other questions? No? Okay, well then let's thank my speaker again. Uh, I think you can hear me. Okay, so I'll get started. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here at, at SIGA and uh, I realize that we are all tired, it's the last talk, and maybe I want a beer, maybe you want one too. I also realize that this is a really broad audience, and there are people who work with uh, general relativity or CMD physics, things like that. But I'm going to try to be not too technical so everybody gets something out of this talk, hopefully. Okay, uh, but first I'd like to thank my, uh, my team and work with a bunch of observers back in Ubik, which is a great deal. If you're a theorist, try to work with observers because it will blow your mind, I promise you. And also, uh, ever since I was a kid, I liked smashing things together. I would get my face and I would smash them together. Now I get to smash galaxies together. So I'm having a lot of fun, okay? And in particular, I'm looking at galaxy events. So in the first part of the talk, I'll try to explain why looking at galaxy events is so important and awesome. And maybe you should drop everything you're doing and think about this, at least for a little while. Uh, also, I'll talk a little bit about my tools. I use the Millennium Simulation to track these pairs back in history. And I make more catalogs and I do a bunch of things. In particular, eventually I'm going to compare them with this known data. But I'm not going to present any of this stuff here. Okay? And uh, if there's time, I'll talk a little bit about future work. Okay? So, why should we care about galaxy pairs? I'll, first, I'll tell you my philosophical reason why I went into this. Basically, galaxy pairs unify two big themes in galaxy formation. The first theme is environment. Basically, the properties of galaxies are influenced by environment. If you look at galaxies that are very isolated, they tend to be blue and they tend to be disk. If you look at galaxies that are in really crowded environments, they tend to be ellipsoidal and they are not forming a lot of stars. So environment plays a big role in galaxy formation. And galaxy pairs is a very specific and very simple example of environment. 
The second theme in Galaxy Formation that is very important is mergers. Because you have to make galaxies from really small galaxies at high redshift and merge them together and make bigger and bigger galaxies. And a galaxy pair is a special stage during this merging process. So this is kind of cool. There are two things in galaxy formation and galaxy pairs encapsulate both of them. Uh, now, many people have been trying to estimate the merger rate of galaxies, and one way is to look at galaxy pairs, and this is a difficult problem. Okay? But that's not the only thing we should worry about when we look at pairs. Many interesting physical effects happen during this interaction. We have the two galaxies, and when they start interacting, they start affecting each other gravitationally. So if I'm a galaxy here and there is a neighbor here, the gravity of that galaxy will perturb me and it will make my gas funnel to the center of the The moment you start funneling gas to the center of the many things happen. You can start making a lot of stars. Maybe if you're getting this pristine gas from the outskirts, the metal is going to go down because that gas hasn't had a chance to make stars and metals. Or maybe if you're lucky, you might even funnel that gas all the way to the black hole and you can trigger it to the end. So people have been finding these things in surveys they have been seen that when you look at single galaxies and when you look at galaxies in pairs, the star formation is enhanced, alien activity is enhanced, and in some cases you might even get dual black holes that are both occurring. And I know there are some people at CIDA who care about black hole, black hole mergers in very general relativity. This is kind of connected to that. If you have two interacting galaxies and two small black holes, and these black holes actually create some gas in that process and become massive, you might get a bigger signal when they actually coalesce in the end. There's a really long story here connecting many processes in physics. Okay? So, just to give you an overall view of what I want to do in the next few years, if I get enough funding, we basically study this system. One study galaxy first from when they are first meeting for the first time, as they interact until they merge. And not just the galaxies themselves, but the gas and the stars and the supermassive. Okay, so if you are ever in a funding committee, think of me. Okay. So what do I use? What is my weapon of choice to study this? So I do something called the beginning simulation. And this has been mentioned a couple of times. In the very last talk, the, uh, the speaker mentioned the simulation. And also Elsa spoke about the simulation. Too. So I'm somewhere in between. I'm not looking at the super large scales. I'm also not looking at world galaxies. I'm looking at somewhere in the middle. This simulation allows you to study uh, galaxies between something like 10 to the 9 up to 10 to the 11 solar masses. So you can look at a broad range of galaxies. This is very ideal for the kind of things I want to do. And if you're curious about how uh, I apply the simulation, you can look at this video. There are more details about that. So one of the things you can do is, well, you can look at structure formation. You can follow the simulation throughout all areas. These are high redshift. And you see that there are little places that are slightly over dense, these places collapse, and they start merging with, with one another. And galaxies form in these fields. And as you merge these fields together, you get bigger and bigger fields. So as you can see here, these are with very little, with only small galaxies, and as you shift down, you start seeing a lot of massive galaxies. And I mentioned here that, uh, well, this is uh, an embodied simulation, but people started thinking about this long before we had this computational model that mentioned big one here. Now you can do something else too with these simulations. You can focus on a particular redshift and you can make these mock catalogs. So you can make something that looks like a survey, but everything is simulated. So here I'm looking at, you can see that well, each color represents a different galaxy beam, so yellow ones are very massive galaxies, and you have a bunch of them. You also see a lot of interesting structures. You see here like the voids, and you see these filaments. You can see this kind of super cluster. That's really nice. This is something you see in surveys, and you also reproduce in this image. But there is more to it. You can do many cool things with simulations because you're in control. For instance, you can take your mock survey, and maybe you are interested in this kind of super cluster, and you're wondering what's going on there. So you can zoom in and see what's going on. You see the super cluster, and there you see these three galaxies. And you may ask yourself, oh, this that's kind of interesting. So maybe I can zoom in a little bit more and see if I find anything interesting. So you can zoom a little bit more and a little bit more. 
and maybe you find a system you're interested in. You might have millions of galaxies, but you have the ability to focus on interesting systems and not just focus on their physical properties, but with the simulation you can also try to predict what they're going to do, if they're going to merge with each other, you can also track them back in time and see their history. So this is a, I'm really excited about this slide and about working in this field for many reasons. And I want to spend a couple of seconds telling you why. And the reason is the following. The way we do astronomy is changing. It's changing very quickly. We have bigger computers, better computers. We have bigger surveys. We have a lot of data. So this is a field that's becoming very data driven. And our ability to analyze all this complex data is very important. It's very important that we get good at it. And this is not only true in astronomy, it's also true in many fields of science. So for example, if you think in economics, there's all these things going on in the globe. You have a global economy, and you, hopefully you would think that it would be nice to have a connection between what's going on globally to what is going on at the individual level. The global economy might be affecting us as individuals, and our behavior collectively could affect the globe. So this is a really exciting idea. And this is an example in astronomy, OK? So we have this really nice survey with millions of galaxies. And I can focus on any particular configuration I care about. So for, for example, by zooming in, I found this pair of galaxies. And then there is this guy over here. So you might ask yourselves, well, what's going to happen? Uh, are these guys going to merge with each other? Is this guy going to eat this one? Uh, so what's going on? People who work with galaxy pairs, people who try to measure the merger rate of galaxies, you should assume that if you have a close pair of galaxies, these things are going to merge with each other. So that's a standard assumption. Okay. But that's not necessarily true. You have to be very careful. So it's kind of like you might think of, for example, if you go back to when you were a teenager and you had a girlfriend or a boyfriend, and you're dating that person and you say, oh, just because I'm dating her or him, I mean, we're going to get married. Here, just because these guys are together, they've got to merge with each other. That is not necessarily the case. Maybe you're dating someone in high school, and then Brad Pitt comes along, he's better looking than you, he sells your girlfriend away, and you end up alone. So that could be the case here. These, gal these galaxies are in love with each other, but then Brad Pitt comes along and steals one of them. So just because you have a close pair of galaxies in the sky, doesn't mean that they're going to merge with one another. One has to be very careful. And it's in a situation where cosmological simulations can be extremely useful. So, next I'm going to show you actually what happens in the simulation to these three galaxies. And um, the hope is that Brad Pitt doesn't win. Okay? So, had I selected these galaxies at high redshift, for example, say redshift 5, and for someone working with galaxy formation, redshift 5 means high redshift. CV folks might disagree, but for us, this is really high redshift. Imagine I, imagine, I imagine I find this triplet in my survey at high ratio. Then I can track the pairing love, and then I can track the right? Have these three guys. These guys come together. The solid circle is a halo. The dotted circle is a sub halo. So this guy becomes the satellite of that guy. And then you have this guy nearby. Then they come together. These two merge with each other, and then they fall into this guy. So these guys, these two, this pair, actually had a chance to merge before Brad Pitt came along. So I hate Brad Pitt somewhere, but that didn't happen. But that might not be the case in every single case. OK? So well, this is just one particular example, but I have millions of galaxies in my mock survey. So that is time to do the statistics. Okay? So in fact, at Redshift 0, I have around 6 million galaxies. Okay? And uh, well, you want to look for pairs. So if you are a brute, you do brute force, you basically just take each galaxy and compare it to all the galaxies in the whole universe, and that would give you about 36 trillion pairs, and that would burn your computer, and that would fill your disk, and you would be very frustrated. This is not a very smart way to look for pairs. You don't do it brute force. So what I did is the following rule. I lived in Italy for a couple of years, and Rome is there, so the Romans used to divide and compare. Right? So what I did is I divided the simulation into little cubes. And basically, if I'm inside a cube, then I chose 10 megaparsecs, but you can choose any size you want. If I'm inside a cube, I just look for a pair inside that. 
okay? Instead of looking for parts all over the universe. And maybe if you're near the edges, maybe you might want to look at the neighboring, neighboring cubes. But this really speeds things up, okay? And I, I did this, I ran this code, and I found this catalog of tools, galaxy pairs, and the millennium simulation. The millennium simulation gives you position and it gives you uh, six dimensional velocities, but observers don't actually have access to all of that. If you talk to someone who's looking at galaxy pairs in, say, this longitudinal survey, they will tell you, oh, you can actually just measure the projected separation, and maybe you can only measure line of sight velocity. So the line of sight velocity increases. Okay? So observationally, you're limited, but if you hire someone who has cosmological simulations, that person can tell you some clues about what's actually going on in three dimensional space. Okay? As you can see, Separation and relative velocity are important things to measure, both observationally and in the simulation. The first thing I tried is like, I said, okay, I'm going to make histograms, probability distributions, looking at these pairs of the relative velocities in beams of separation. So these are really wide pairs, and these are really close pairs. Okay? I was really hoping I would find something really cool and interesting. And if you look at this plot, it's pretty boring. It doesn't really tell you much. I think the only thing you see is that if you're looking at really close pairs, the diversity of velocities is really limited. Whereas if you look at really wide pairs, the diversity is a little bit less limited. But it, you don't, it doesn't really teach you much. So I started thinking, OK, I was hoping to get something cool and exciting. I got this boring plot. What if something else is driving the relative velocities of these galaxies? So what if instead of looking at distances and velocities, I look at mass? Maybe this mass that is driving the kind of velocities you have in these galaxy patterns. If these velocities are really high, they're not going to merge with each other. If these velocities are really slow, maybe they have a chance to have an effect on each other. Okay. So you would think, if you have two small galaxies, maybe because the potential is really shallow, they're not going to move too quickly. You have two massive galaxies, the potential is really thin, and these things are going to be flying quickly. So I said to myself, well, maybe this is what's going on. Let's measure, let's basically bin this velocity distribution in beams of mass and see if I see this trend. This is what I would naively expect. And to my surprise, I found, well, I, I, I had mixed feelings about the result. If you look, these are basically, I'm plotting the velocity distributions, velocity differences, and each panel is uh, it's being in mass, so you take the mass of the two galaxies, you add them up, and you put them in different beams of mass. So these are 10 to be above 10 to 11, and these are below 10 to 10 solar masses. If you look at very massive pairs, you see that the turn is there. These guys are moving fast, and these guys are moving way faster. When you look at low mass pairs, you see that uh, you don't quite see the same thing. You see that, for example, these are really low mass pairs, and yet they're moving at really high speeds, comparable to the really massive ones. So that doesn't quite make sense in this picture I announced before. How is it possible that you have two tiny galaxies with very little mass flying relative to each other so quickly? What the hell is going on here? Okay. So what I did is, OK, let me do a scatter plot of velocity versus mass. And I found all that is a complete mess. I was expecting a really high correlation between mass and relative velocity. And I found this really nasty cloud of things at low mass. This is mass, and this is velocity. However, if you squint your eyes, you see that at extremely high masses, you cannot see that the trend is there. I was hoping for a trend to fall away across, and I see that it's kind of here. I also noticed that it's kind of looks like the United States, but it's in New England, which is really small. Okay. So how can we make New England completely big and dominant? Well, as a scientist, you make hypotheses. My hypothesis is this. Not all pairs are strongly merging. Not all pairs in my simulation are actually merging with one another. So my assumption is if two, if two galaxies are in the same dark matter halo, I'm not pointing that, but they are actually dominating the halo. So you have the two, let's say, the two most massive galaxies in the halo, most likely, either they're about to merge, or they will merge soon, and they are strongly merged. Okay? So that's my, that's my test. 
And to do this, well, I need to put information about whether you belong in the same halo or not. Whether you're the central dominant galaxy in the halo, or if you're a, a satellite. Or if one galaxy in your pair is in one halo and the other galaxy is in a different. This is something that's difficult to do in observation, but with a simulation, it's a given. Okay? So, since nobody in the room works with dark matter halos all the time, I like to give analogies just so that it goes into your brain. I like to think of dark matter halos as classrooms. You have a professor and his grad students are really young. And you pair them up. You say that the teacher, the professor, is the central dominant galaxy and the kids are the satellites. Okay? So you may have a pair in which one galaxy is the central and the other is the satellite. You have Golden Boy who publishes a lot and he gets all the attention. So this is a central satellite pair. Okay? Or you may have a different configuration in which two grad students are working together on writing papers. They are not the PIs of the group. So they're not the central galaxy, there are two satellite galaxies and they're actually interacting with each other. You might think of this situation as, for example, in the Milky Way. You can say this is the Milky Way and maybe these are the LMC and the SMC. But two satellite galaxies are interacting with each other. Okay. Notice that in these two situations I'm assuming that there is a single clip. But that not, need not be the case for all of them. You can have more exotic. Uh, situations and I call them flavors because I like part of it. So you can have, for example, it could be the case that you have two halos and you're actually pairing up the two central galaxies. So this is a central central pair. Or you can have more funky cases in which you have a, a, a halo there and maybe he's the center of that halo and I have my satellite here and my satellite is interacting with him. Or it might be the case that I'm a central galaxy in my halo and she's a central galaxy in her halo. I have, a, I have a satellite, she has a satellite, and those two satellites are talking to each other. So these two students, these students are chit-chatting and not paying attention. So these are really strange configurations. A priori, it's hard to know which kind of flavor is going to dominate. There's only way, one way to find out is to actually measure these things in the simulation. Okay? And that's what I did. My claim before was that if you are if your galaxy pair involves two galaxies dominating one dark matter halo, most likely this thing are interacting strongly and are about to match. Okay? So let's look about uh, at what happens when I only look at pairs, not in the five flavors, but only in the first flavor, the one that involves a central and a satellite. So this is all my pairs, and this is only the central satellite pairs. New England was really small here. You see the train here that is really small? The moment you drop everything else and only keep central satellites, you see that the train is very pronounced. So uh, that kind of shows you that it's important to think about dark matter halos and central galaxies and satellite galaxies when you're looking at the sky. Okay. What about the other more funky configurations like uh, my satellite talking to the satellite? So I went ahead and measured those, and I found that they contribute very little. It's only that a few percent of them are actually in that situation. The majority of them are central on satellites, and there is a big contribution of satellite satellite galaxies that are in a halo of a bigger cluster. Okay. So the lesson here is, when you're looking at galaxy pairs, don't just assume that they're going to merge with each other. You have to look at the neighborhood and see there is a really massive galaxy that might eat them that might pull them away, and maybe even though they're really close in the sky, their dynamics might be governed by the dark matter here of a really massive galaxy. These things are close in the sky, but they might just be traveling together, and eventually they're going to merge into a really massive galaxy somewhere in the middle. And the thing is, since you can, there is a strong correlation between stellar mass and halo mass, you can actually estimate things like the real radius of a galaxy, and you can quantify this numbers in terms of the area of matrix, okay? Now let's see what answer we get when we do some statistics. So I'm going to show exactly the same plot I showed before, basically. Distributions of velocity in bits of mass, okay? But I'm only going to include the central satellite systems. And when you do that, alas, you see that even for low cases, you see that it's really strong time. If you have 
galaxy curves with low masses, you have small velocities, relative velocities. And as you move to higher and higher masses, you have higher and higher velocities that you would expect a naive group. Whereas if you just put everything, you still have these crazy forms. Okay? So, well, this is a nice thing you can do in a simulation, but an observer is not going to have access to three dimensional separations or three dimensional velocities. So, what you can do is, well, you can maybe show everything in terms of projected separation and line of sight velocities, which is what an observer means. And you see, well, you also recover the trend. As you start looking at more and more massive galaxies, things are going to move more quickly. And, are, and, and when you didn't do that, you didn't do that. So this is what I've been doing the last few months as a CEDA fellow. It's been a lot of fun. And now I'm going to incorporate a different tool, uh, which is basically binary mergers of, of galaxies. So instead of looking at a really big cosmological simulation, now I'm going to focus on a small, of a, a, high, a high resolution, high resolution of the galaxies and see what I can run there and how that connects to the cosmological simulations. And this is something I just started very recently with uh, a graduate at Harvard. His name is Victoria. He has these really nice simulations of two galaxies. And here I'm showing the separation of the two galaxies. And here I'm showing the star formation thing and how it gets enhanced as this process happens. Okay? And uh, I just got access to a really big computer, so I'm really excited about this. Okay? And, okay. So, as a summary, so these are my four conclusions. This is something I want you to remember. This is a take home point. So if I see you in a year and I ask you, what did I talk about at the city of the meeting, you should be able to tell me. Or if we go to dinner after dinner, I'll ask you, okay? So the take home points are, with things like, with cosmological simulations, you can make more catalogs of galaxies, you can millions of galaxies, but you can also focus on interesting individual systems. You can look at their dynamics, you can look at their past merger histories, and if you select these interesting configurations, you can track them forward in time and see if they're going to merge with each other or if Brad Pitt's going to come out and be one. Uh, by looking at galaxy pairs, you can look at separation, you can look at relative velocities, and what I found is that mass has a big role in their dynamics. Naively, you would think that the more massive the galaxies, the faster they're going to move relative to each other, and I found that it wasn't the case everywhere However, if you only select pairs that are a central and a satellite, in those cases you do recover this notion that the more massive the galaxies, the faster they're going relative to each other. The message here is that uh, if you look at central and satellite galaxies, those two galaxies dominate their potential bound. The, the dynamics they experience is dominated by them. But if you look at other things like say satellite, satellite pairs, they don't dominate the dynamics. They are governed by their host halo. That might be a halo with a very massive central galaxy. Okay? So when you look at closed galaxy press in the sky, you have to think about that, about their membership. Okay? And I uh, also talked a little bit about what I'm going to do next, which is emergency universities. Thank you. galaxies live, and you can think of the FOF as a property of the galaxy. 
Now, I agree with you that it's not trivial to say uh, I'm a satellite or, or something. And uh, it's a really tricky business. There are cases where maybe you have two dominant galaxies and it's not clear which one should be the central. Okay? But that is fine. Uh, you can still talk about, you can still say this is my dominant galaxy or this is not my dominant galaxy. So if you use another kilo factor like the rock star or pure echo would you have the same results? Are your results all just against the same I, I think so. I think that the main idea would survive to a very good approximation. So I think the deviation would be really small, except in really particular cases. So for example, if you look at the kilo finders in millennium, sometimes it makes mistakes when you go in really dense regions, really close to the central galaxy that in my mind might not identify membership correctly. So in those cases where you're probing with really, really small scale, there might be a discrepancy. But I think if you're really interested in those scales, maybe you shouldn't be using something like millennium, you should be something, using something more sophisticated and more Overall, the conclusions of this talk, if I were using Rockstar or Subfine, so I, I think I would get more messages. Okay. Any other Try scaling delta V by say the velocity dispersion of the host halo. Uh, I haven't because this is really new, so I got the data a couple of weeks ago, but I, that's what I'll do next. I, I mean, I, I basically the message here is when you look at pairs in the sky, you should not just think of actual physical separations and relative velocities, but you should scale things in terms of say the velocity dispersion or the visual uh, velocity and also the visual radius. So if I ask you next year, what did I talk about? Would you remember? Right there. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank our last speaker.